Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about contemporary techniques for flute. Um, some of you might be asking why I'm not saying extended techniques. I think contemporary techniques is a better description of what they are. Extended techniques kind of give this idea that they're hard and they're weird and they're something other. Contemporary techniques are what they are. They're something that's modern and has been just developed and they tend to be applied in contemporary music. We're going to go through the really standard ones, the ones that are in the Robert Dick book that are in a lot of the established contemporary pieces, and then I'm going to make another video later that goes through some of the ones that are a little bit less standard or still developing. So the first one is Flutter Tongue. Flutter Tongue has honestly been around for longer than the rest of these techniques. You can see it in Iber, you can see it in Yo, you can see it in a lot of the early 20th century music. So it's even considered a standard technique. It's not even contemporary or an extended technique anymore. But it's still something that we have to talk about. It sounds like this. And then this is going to be how you notate it. There's two ways to create the sound, guttural and tongue flutter. Um, it's a physical thing, and so some flute players can only do the tongue, some people can only do guttural, I'm a guttural only type player, and there are some very lucky few that can do both. You can kind of create the sound of a guttural flutter with a tongue flutter and you can create the sound of a tongue flutter with a guttural flutter you just have to work on it but honestly if you're writing for flutter tongue and you want a difference in sound indicate the difference in sound not the difference in pr sound production because not every player is going to be able to do it the next oldest technique is key clicks you see it in Verez's tw density 21.5 um and it's been pretty much established as a common contemporary technique since then. Um, it's literally key percussion. It sounds like this. And this is how you notate it. Something to note with key clicks is that they are limited in speed. There's only so much that you can do with an ascending line because each click has to have its own separate action. So if you want specific pitches to sound with the key clicks, you do have to give the performer time to lift the right key and hit it and then move on. With descending lines, you're putting down the keys as you go down because that's the way the flute works so they can go faster, but with ascending, where you're meant to be lifting keys as you go up, you have to add an extra downward motion with the right key so that the right pitch sounds. Um, it's not something that's impossible and it definitely is something that you can write. It's just you have to be very careful and very cognizant of the fact that ascending lines are very difficult to do in key clicks and you will have to give the player time. It's something where I 100% recommend to get a flute player to try it before you ever try to put it in a published piece because honestly there's some things that are just not possible with a particular technique. Also with key clicks is you have to be very careful of the dynamic. There really is only one dynamic of key click and it's not all that loud as you could hear. It's gonna be even more muffled if there's flute tone along with the key click because the tone is gonna cover some of the percussive sound. So you do have to be careful of where you're putting it. If it's in the texture of other instruments, chances are you're not going to hear them. The last kind of word of warning is that there are some flute players who don't like doing key clicks. Everything I've ever read and everything I've ever done has said that it doesn't actually hurt the flute or injure the pads or anything like that, but there are some people who would prefer to not risk that, and that's an understandable thing. It is our instrument, we spent a lot of money, and pads are expensive. And so there's a lot of people who are hesitant to do key clicks or are hesitant to do them in a way that will be loud enough to hear them. 
So keep in mind when you're writing for a specific performer, ask them. See if they're willing to do them because if they're not, there are many more percussive sounds that are going to work just as well that they're probably willing to do. Along those lines, the next sound is slop time. It's also called tongue pizzicato and there's kind of a little bit of a discussion about which one it is. Um, for me, they're interchangeable. It sounds like this. And it's notated like this. Um, this is where we start getting into these slightly less solid notation guides, but this is kind of the general way that people write them. They are true percussion and they're going to be louder than key clicks. You can pair them with key clicks as well, which amplifies both sounds. That's a really great way to make key clicks sound louder. And again, they have a limited facility. There's a literal tongue action to create the sound, so there's only so much you can do. Um, there is a physical limit on how fast they can go, especially if you want them to be loud and true and carry. Um, there are ways to make them faster, but they're not gonna, it, you lose some of the intensity of the sound. The next one is tongue ram. And tongue ram probably has the least solid notation for it, um, but it sounds like this. And I would prefer for it to be notated like this. Basically, it's rolling the flute into your mouth and then with a very quick burst of air, stopping the tone hole with your tongue. It means that the flute speaks a seventh lower and it's like a quick thunking shot. They're quite difficult to master. There is a huge learning curve to them. So if you're working with a player who hasn't done them before, you might want to limit your use of them or give them enough time to really figure it out. It honestly took me almost a year to get them solid and even then sometimes I miss. They can, especially when they're not done properly, have a lot of air sound to them and that's what we're trying to minimize as players but it's something to keep in mind that if, even if you have the greatest player in the world, sometimes they're gonna miss and you're gonna get air sounds. They're not that loud again, they're one dynamic and you again have the tongue facility problem. Um, you're going to see that a lot with the percussive sounds is there's limitations to what we can do because your face can't do more. Then you get into some of the air sounds. Obviously there's air sounds and we're going to talk about that in the other video because those are a little bit less solid and there's a lot more variance on that. But you have whistle tones which are very very high, very very quiet overtones basically. They sound like this. And my preferred notation is this. There are some other ways to do it, but honestly, this is the way I like to see them the best. My suggestion with whistle tones is that you don't notate specific pitches, you s notate maybe the bass notes that you want to use and let the player figure it out. But honestly, whistle tones are so hard to control and they're so quiet that you have to be very, very careful with the way you're writing for them because you will cause the flute player to do a lot of work for them to never be heard. I honestly don't, without amplification, there's really no way for anything other than a solo line of whistle tones to be heard. And even then in a big hall or something like that, it's gonna take a lot of luck and hope that no one coughs. And as you can kind of hear, they do waver and warble and they're not stable pitches. It is possible to get stable pitches, but it takes a lot of practice and a lot of control and in performance, it's really hard to do because your heart is racing and it's so hard to really focus on skimming over the top of the sound the way you have to. So my best advice for whistle tones is leave them up to the performer. Unless you have 
ex an extremely experienced performer or you have a very, very specific thing you want and even then you need to make sure that the flutist is comfortable with it. Then you have jet whistles. They're probably one of composer's favorite sounds because they're so cool. Um, they sound like this. And this is how I'd prefer them to be notated. Basically what this one is, is a really fast burst of air directly through the flute. They can be pitched to an extent, like the, especially the bass pitch that you're starting from can be dictated. Um, the upper range cannot be. And the word of warning that I have with this one is do not stack this without consulting a player. So don't put multiple in a row unless you've talked to someone and seen them do it. I say this because the creation of a jet whistle is basically emptying the entire contents of your lungs into the flute in a millisecond or so. A little more than that, but it's still, you're emptying your lungs very, very quickly. If you start stacking them, you're causing the flutist to hyperventilate, which means they're gonna get dizzy they're gonna get lightheaded, and I've seen almost someone almost pass out because of stacked jet whistles, especially very big ones where they're really getting that full rush of sound. So just be very, very careful and very aware of the fact that this is a technique that is actually relatively problematic for the flute player themselves. They're great, and you shouldn't avoid them, but just be very careful with how generously you're using them. And the final technique we're going to go through in this video is singing and playing, which is honestly my favorite thing that the flute can do. There's a lot of different varieties of sounds that you can create, and some examples of them are here. And this is how you notate this, or how I'd prefer it to be seen. There's some people who use multiple staves, and that's something to bring up with the performer. I prefer having them in the same staves because then I'm not looking at dual lines where I'm trying to figure out which one's which and trying to get my brain wrapped around both things. But I also know some players who really prefer the separate lines because then they know Exactly, and if there's some overlap or the lines cross, they're not constantly questioning which note is which. So it's really up to performer preference, and also whether you're interested in trying to deal with vocal crossings, basically, in the same staff. So I will admit that there are some reasons to use multiple staves, but if I had the choice or a composer asked me, I would ask them to put it in the same staff. What you need to keep in mind with this technique is the vocal range of the performer. And that seems obvious, but if you're writing for a specific person, then write for their vocal range. The piece might be more limited for who else can play it, but you'll exploit the voice of the performer way better and it'll be a better match. My voice is incredibly low, as you can hear in the recordings, I can sing a full octave below the flute. As a female performer, that's not very common. So the pieces that are written for me specifically are a limited piece, or are limited in who can perform them as is, just because you're using an octave that doesn't necessarily exist in the performer's voice. That being said, playing with the different textures and the different octaves of the flute, and even where the person, the player's voice can be, is really interesting. You get a lot of difference tones, especially when you're crossing the voice and they're very close together, 
or when you're moving one voice with a stable bass. Um, you can hear that a lot in those recordings. Um, here's a good example of that. But it's probably the most flexible thing. And as you can hear, there's some very intense sounds that are possible, especially when the voice is lower than the flute. There's a lot of very crunchy, very cool sounds that can be created. And if you put the, vo the voice in an upper octave where it's a little bit lighter and more head voice, there's some really beautiful, very delicate textures that can be created. Um, as always, my best advice is to talk to the performer that you're working with or talk to just a performer. Have them try some things and see what they can do as this is the technique that honestly, as I said, has the most flexibility because there's so many ways to set it. So that's my rundown of the standard contemporary techniques and I will work on getting a more experimental video up for you guys. If you have any sounds or techniques that you guys want me to cover in that video, please let me know. As always, the 52 weeks video will be up on Saturday. If you're interested in supporting me more and getting access to more of what I'm doing with 52 weeks, please check out my Patreon. If you like this video, give it a like, and if you're new here, subscribe, and I will see you guys very soon.